thank you everyone for, for joining us tonight. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen here. Hopefully that will work. Um, let's see. Okay. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. Um, so as, uh, as Mike said, I'm going to start off this presentation with uh, a little talk about the uh, widespread weak snowpack that we have across the West. Um, then I'll talk about uh, the U.S. avalanche fatalities that we've had across the country this year. It's been a pretty, uh, pretty tragic year um, in many states. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about decision making um, in the backcountry, uh, what factors can influence it, and hopefully how to help you guys make better decisions than us as well. Uh, finally, I'll finish up with uh, some of the season um, history of the local Sierra, and then I thank you with questions. Um, hope some of you were able to tune in to our previous presentations by Steve and Chris earlier this winter, talking about some backcountry basics and Avalanche 101, and uh, this is kind of uh, building on those. Um, so I'm not going to touch too much about the uh, those things. Um, I'm going to get a little bit more into some nitty gritty and uh, a little bit more of uh, some of the human factors involved. So. Um, I'll get going here. Um, so far this season, the U.S. has had 33 avalanche fatalities. Um, this is a graph you can see from the last boy since 1951. Uh, we've definitely had a spike in the uh, early 2000s, late 90s when we reached some 30s. Uh, the last four or five years have been down in the 20s or even lower. Um, you know, there's still a lot of season left this year. Uh, we sure hope that number doesn't rise, but uh, unfortunately, inevitably, it probably will, but fingers crossed it won't. Um, but um, so this, this 33 fatalities um, of note, uh, 14 of them actually occurred in the first week of February alone. And then 10 more happened again in the third week of February, uh, which are extremely high numbers. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about what are the, the factors that created this. Um, first of all, um, we had a really widespread weak snowpack across the West. Uh, many years, um, one area or another, whether it be Utah, Idaho, or Colorado, often has a weak snowpack, but for the whole country to have this weak snowpack is kind of unheard of. Um, and so what creates a weak snowpack? Um, I'm gonna let um, Doug Chabot from Montana uh, tell us a little bit more. Uh, he has some great videos. I think he does a great job explaining it actually in the field. So I'm gonna, play that and hopefully that will give you a better idea of why we have this weak snowpack. Um, basically it's an early season snowfall, a long dry cold period, and then we get heavy snow. When we have really cold temperatures, fastening can happen very quickly. And the reason for that is that it's in order to create fasting, we need what's called a temperature gradient in the snowpack. It needs, it needs to be a large temperature difference. And the ground, the ground is pretty much always zero degrees Celsius. So we have zero degrees Celsius at the ground. I have a thermometer and I measured the snow surface temperature and here it was minus 17. So in 45 centimeters, we had a 17 degree difference, which is quite large. Now what happens is the snow here isn't very dense. There's a lot of air in the snow. And that air in the snow is saturated. It's 100% humidity. It means it's full of water molecules. What water vapor will do is it migrates through the snowpack as it moves from warmer areas to colder areas. So down at the ground, uh, the water vapor is slowly moving up through the snowpack. Now, when water vapor moves, it's only moving from one snow crystal to another snow crystal. And when it moves to that other snow crystal and refreezes, it freezes in this ice crystal, which is incredibly angular. It's no so as the water vapor is moving from crystal to crystal, what's driving that process is this temperature difference. Now, there's a threshold, the minimum threshold for this to happen, and that is one degree Celsius for 10 centimeters. Since we have 45 centimeters here, that's four and a half degrees Celsius. We would need difference in order to see faceting. We have 17. So we have almost four times the amount of temperature gradient needed to drive this process and create facets. And that's why here we're seeing lots of facets and we're seeing them grow incredibly quickly. Okay, 
so I know that kind of gets into some scientific technical jargon, jargon there. Um, hopefully some of you can follow it. If you, if you don't, that's okay as well. Um, I think it's a really interesting process. Um, fortunately, we don't need to understand that to understand avalanches. So don't be hung up on that. Um, I want to show you one more video that, uh, that Doug did um, talking about the danger of these facets. Um, let me see if this will work. Okay. Um, all right. T22. So I'm here uh, above Hebgen Lake, it's southeast facing slope. And I have to say, like, as we were skinning up here, we're on a nice skin track. We broke away from the skin track, um, tried to get some collapsing and cracking, got nothing. So I wasn't seeing any obvious signs of instability. The snow was just fantastic. I mean, it's just, it's just begging to be skied. And, uh, and we were even ha saw some tracks that went down kind of the steep slopes. And I have to admit that there was a bit of pull on the old human factor side of things thinking like, wow, like no signs of instability, ski tracks, good snow, maybe we should ski it. But obviously being a professional, decided that would not be a good thing to do. And this is why, because we have facets on all aspects, all over the place in Southwest Montana. As we're skiing around, as we're skinning uphill, we're finding that the slab is getting a little stiffer. Our skis aren't sinking in near as much as they were a few days ago. And it's getting harder to affect this layer down here. And so we're not seeing, we're not getting the huge, the huge whoops. But even though this weak layer is everywhere, this slab varies in some areas the slab might only be a third as thick. In other areas, it might be double. Where you would trigger the slide is from thinner areas of the slope. So even on a, on a down below us here, this uh, nice 35 degree slope, if you could guarantee that there weren't thin spots in it, you'd probably be all right. But we know that's not the case. We know that there's variability in the terrain. We know that in thinner areas, your skis and your body weight are going to collapse this layer. And then what happens is this shoots out and goes underneath all the thicker snow and we get huge avalanches. So what we're going to do today is as much as we would like to ski the gut of this, we're not going to. This is showing instability. The recipe is bad and we are going to head down our skin track which is also gonna have some wonderful tree skiing on the way back. All right. So I hope, hope that gives you a little bit of an idea. Uh, these videos were taken actually uh, several years ago, uh, but that's what the snowpack is like uh, throughout much of the Rockies in the West. Um, basically these weak sugary facets underneath a slab of snow. Um, this is a bottom line written uh, this season. Um, it's very typical of many of the avalanche centers across the country. I'll just read it real quick. Light snowfall on a snowpack near its tipping point means that avalanche conditions are dangerous. Very large avalanches could run naturally. If you travel in avalanche terrain, you could easily trigger deep avalanches that break near the ground and run far. You can even trigger them from lower angled slopes below, so pay close attention to any exposure to big terrain overhead. Steep wind loaded slopes can produce largest avalanches, but even in wind sheltered terrain, can easily trigger an avalanche big enough to bury you. Avoid travel on or below slopes steeper than about 30 degrees. So this year, when this layer is reactive as it has been, um, people really, when they go over 30 degrees, they can trigger avalanches. Um, and people who are out skiing, who can, you know, in the Sierra right now, it's, it's not that case, but in your other places of the country, you know, skiing, skiing steep lines is really just not an option. Um, so I'm gonna show you uh, each one of these avalanche accidents and hopefully um, we can learn something from them. Uh, I'll tell you some details about how they happened. Um, what I'd like you to do is try to ask yourself, how could this have been me? It's easy to judge 
folks from the armchair position of like, what were they thinking doing this? Like, why were they out there in that slope that day? You know, these danger, those persistent layers are there. And, but um, you know, there's a lot of different factors going on in people's heads um, and just try to put yourself in their position and how could have this possibly been me? And some of you out there, this would never have been you, but there's a lot of, out, a lot of people out there probably where you could picture yourself in these situations. I personally, I could picture myself in quite a few of these situations. I hopefully would make different choices, but um, I'm as human as anyone. So the first avalanche of the season occurred on December 18th in Wyoming, a place called Sheep Pass. And it was uh, one snowmobiler that was caught, buried, and killed. Um, it was a persistent soft slab, meaning it did fail in these lower layers. Uh, R2D2 means it's a, 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 sm a smallish to mediumish size avalanche with a two foot crown. You can see the picture here, the crown line goes here. It's not a huge avalanche by any means. Basically, it was one snowmobile uh, in a party of five um, that was out snowmobiling around here. And uh, he, he was out and went up on the slope here a little further than the rest. Whoops, sorry about that. Um, and he triggered a slide. He deployed his airbag. Um, and unfortunately, uh, he was killed by trauma. So even though the airbag was there, um, he, he one foot was partially unburied, they could, they could see, um, but the trauma is what killed this guy. December 18th, Ohio Pass in Colorado. One skier was caught, buried, and killed in this avalanche, a similar size. Uh, it was a skier by himself. He was actually a very experienced skier. He was uh, just retired from 40 years of ski patrolling. Um, this year was his backyard. This is, this is what he knew all about his whole life. Um, he had skied a couple of laps uh, on different slopes this day, and then he came back to this ridge line and ran into a few other people. Um, and he told them that he was heading back to his car to go to work. Um, and so the other people went and skied, and he went and skied. And you can't see, but there's some tracks in these trees. There's several tracks in these trees here, but there's not any tracks further out. Uh, so he pushed it a little further, thinking, oh, there's tracks here. I'll just go a little further out in this opening. And he went and skied it tr and triggered a slide and was buried. Um, he was wearing a transceiver, and even though he was alone, um, you know, that doesn't do you much good in terms of being uh, helped, uh, but it did help the, uh, the other people in the, uh, that wasn't in his party when they came back and realized that an avalanche had happened. They turned their transceivers on and were able to find his body and dig him out. Um, so sadly, he did not survive either. Next avalanche, December 19th, Battleship, Colorado. Um, this happened... Uh, this, this happened with two skiers. They were out um, skiing in the backcountry. Um, this is actually the third run they had done. They had done several, a couple others before this. Um, probably, not sure, but stepping it up each time and maybe a little bit more exposure, a little bit more steeper terrain. And so they're finding, you know, that they were, they were skiing and not creating any avalanches. And so they maybe stepped it up a little bit more for this run. Um, this day was... One of the warmest days in quite a while, um, and it warmed rapidly this day. It was five degrees in the very early morning, and it raised to 34 degrees at 11 a.m., which is, which is one of the red flags uh, that we, we talk about in terms of rapid warming, um, which makes snow that's sensitive even more sensitive. Um, both of these skiers were on their up track. They were skidding up this slope. Um, they both had airboy bags on. They deployed their airbags. Um, but they were each buried. One was one to three feet deep and the other one was four to six feet deep. Um, uphill mode, uh, likely their skis were locked in. Um, when we're uphill, that we crank those bindings up and uh, it's really hard for the ski to release. That might have had something to do uh, with what anchored them down and got them buried. December 26th, First Creek, Colorado, another one in Colorado. Um, one skier was caught, buried and killed, again, a persistent avalanche. Um, this is, again, a skier by himself. Um, he triggered a small avalanche, relatively, um, D1.5. So it, the avalanche by itself didn't have the force to kill someone or bury someone. Um, he wasn't wearing a transceiver. He was alone. Um, so a transceiver wouldn't have helped him anyway. Um, but he triggered this and went through trees and was, and was killed by trauma. January 8th, Dutch Draw in Utah, um, one side country snowboarder was caught, buried, and killed here. Um, this was a side country uh, snowboarder, so he rode lift service and he went out of bounds. Um, he left the resort and then uh, 
midway. So it actually was, there was two people, a skier and a snowboarder. They left the resort. The snowboarder went first. He was midway down uh, the slope uh, and the skier started their descent um, when he was still skiing. Um, after making two turns, uh, the avalanche broke at the, ski, uh, the uh, skier's feet and the snowboarder was still midway down the slope and he was caught, buried, and unfortunately died from the avalanche. The skier was not caught in the avalanche. Um, neither of them were wearing uh, transceivers or had any avalanche rescue gear. Had, that, had they had transceivers and shovels and probes, it's very possible they could have been found and not killed. Um, as it turns out, rescue dogs were able to recover the body later. Another one in Utah, Square Top Peak, another side country rider, um, another uh, skier. Um, so a pair of experienced skiers, both had avalanche gear this time. They read the avalanche bulletin. They were well aware of the uh, potential dangers. This is, I forgot to mention that the, uh, the danger rating for the day on all these slides are indicated by the color of, of the, the text box and their little icon there. So this is a high danger day. The ones previous to this were, were moderate and, and considerable. Um, so again, two expert experienced skiers with Avi gear uh, read the bulletin, knew it was high danger up high and considerable below tree line. Uh, two thirds of the way down their, their slope, uh, they were up here in, these, in this ridge line skiing in a safe, relatively safe zone. Uh, they stopped and discussed which way they wanted to go. Uh, one of the skiers saw this open slope with lots of nice snow and was like, I want to go ski over here. And the, and the other guy was like, no, nope, I don't feel comfortable with that. I want to stick in the trees. And uh, the other guy was pretty adamant about going and skiing this pitch. And so the one guy stayed in the trees and watched him. And uh, he made it uh, a little bit out into the slope, first out, and immediately triggered an avalanche that swept him down and buried him. Um, the partner in the trees was nervous about s heading straight back out there to, to rescue him. So he skied down the trees lower down and then traversed out into the slope. And then at that point, he wasn't sure if he was above or below where this guy might be buried. So he, he put on his climbing skins. And then he turned on his beacon and then he found out that his beacon, the partner was further downhill. So he made it to the different partner, um, started digging and, and found him buried three to four, deep, four, three to four feet deep. Um, unfortunately, too much time had passed and, and the person had no longer a pulse and was not breathing and died. Um, had the response been faster, uh, perhaps it could have been a chance for survival, but it's hard to know. This is just maybe illustrating how important it is to practice this and really have these responses second nature so you don't have to think. This one happened on the East Coast. This, avalanches don't often kill people in New Hampshire, but there's mountains and snow, so there's ingredients for it to happen. Uh, this is Mount Monroe in New Hampshire. Uh, one skier was caught, buried, and killed. The, the danger rating was low this day. Um, and this just goes to show you of uh, of what uh, that avalanches can still happen in low danger. Um, this is probably, it says persistent D1. Uh, it was actually a, a, probably a small wind slab. It wasn't a persistent, sorry about that typo up there. Um, but this guy was um, traversing along up high on this slope, some steep terrain, and probably triggered a very relatively small wind slab. And it took him down into this gully and pinned him against this rock and buried him pretty deeply. Uh, he was a very experienced skier. He had a beacon on, even though he was by himself, he wore a beacon. Uh, out of consideration that you know, some, if something did happen to him, other people would be able to at least find his body and that would be helpful. Um, these search and rescuers finally did find the person and the beacon did help them zero in and find his, probe his body. Uh, but it took him an hour and a half to dig out his body because of how deeply he was buried in this train trap. February 1st, the Nose, Colorado. This was three people being killed. Um, this happened with a group of seven people that were in British, uh, that were on a, a backcountry hut trip. Um, danger was considerable, again, the persistent layer. Uh, this is the warmest day since December when this happened, and this is February. So it was, you know, the, the warm, warmer days are making things more sensitive potentially. <clears throat> These skiers all did a good, really good job of skiing this slope higher up, out of the way out of the picture, going one at a time and, and following the, uh, the protocols that we suggest people to follow to be safe so that only one person can be exposed at a time and potentially only one person can get caught in an avalanche. Uh, so they did that, but then when they got to this, this slope above this picture, um, several of the people got there first, and then one of the people just started skiing down, and then before all the party regrouped, um, and then 
three other skiers followed him down. And then midway down the slope, um, the, the fourth skier triggered an avalanche. And these people were buried, as you can see here, nine feet deep, 11 feet deep, and 20 feet deep in this gully. So this is a prime example of a, a terrain trap uh, that can really exponentially um, affect the consequences of even a small slide. The other people got down there and saw the slide and went into search mode. They had their transceivers. They did searches. Um, but they they were they're searching and they were still like four to you know four meters away from some of the signals. Um, so they dug for two hours on their first person and they were still a meter and a half to two meters away from the person. Um, so you know they they actually had to leave for the night and come back the next day and and um, have many more people help in the in the recovery of these bodies. Um, this shows just how, how important communication is and how much important a plan is um, to have places to regroup and to ski slopes one at a time. Um, it's quite possible that, that someone could have still triggered this avalanche, but it would have been one person instead of, instead of four. Um, also of note in this avalanche, uh, one of the beacons was actually, they, they, the searching were, searchers were coming down the slope and found two signals really close to each other. So they thought two of the bodies were buried right on top of each other almost. And as it turns out, that wasn't the case, but one of the transceivers of the buried people was a, a quite an old transceiver and it was sending out a signal that was received as two signals. Um, and so this shows also the importance of, of retiring your devices once you know they get older than 10 years. And I actually have a old Ordovox F1 transceiver that I've been using for years. And actually it's my favorite transceiver. It's really basic, but I'm really practiced and good at it. Um, but I've, last year, I started noticing that when people would beacon check me, they were like, oh, this is weird. It's, it's showing up as two transceiver signals. And then that would go away. But anyway, needless to say, I'm, I'm not using that anymore this year at all. And I wanted to get it sent back and recalibrated, but uh, the company wouldn't do it. They were like, no, this is too old. You just need to get yourself a new one. And I have a new one. I just preferred the old one. But so it's important to use gear that's updated and stay with it. It's a life-saving piece of equipment. So don't skimp. Uh, this is a picture down here of the, the, the 20 foot burial. This is like a three meter over three meter pole. Again, a very, very sad accident. There we all are. Here's another one in uh, Alaska, February 2nd, Bear Mountain. <clears throat> These were actually not skiers uh, or snowboarders. They were climbers. They were climbing this couloir um, when they triggered a wind slab in the upper slope. Uh, it's hard to say that the, the wind slab could have been triggered naturally, um, but it, in any case, they were swept all the way down this couloir and deposited in debris, not buried very deeply, um, buried enough, um, and they were probably suffered trauma on the way down. <clears throat> this one happened in California, the only avalanche accident knock on wood so far this year that has resulted in a fatality in California. This is in Etna, uh, not far from Mount Shasta, but outside of the forecast zone up there. Um, two backcountry tours were caught here, uh, one partially buried and one was buried and killed. Uh, these uh, two slip boarders, or actually a slip boarder and a hiker, were skidding up this slope and stopped right below this ridge line to transition to skiing. Uh, so they're in their transition mode when the avalanche struck. Um, one of the victims was pinned up high on the slope against a tree. The other partner was swept fairly, hard, fairly far down the hill. Um, if one swept fairly far down the hill was not buried, um, and so he turned on his beacon and started heading up the slope, but his beacon uh, wasn't functioning right and uh, it wasn't turning on. And so he still continued up the hill and uh, took out his probe and started probing likely catchment areas. And as uh, he got lucky and was able to actually hit a ski, a ski uh, near a tree and um, he was able to uncover his partner's uh, body. Um, but it took about 25 to 30 minutes later uh, that he did that. So he unfortunately was dead. Um, later on, um, the, the beacons were checked at the parking lot, um, but it was found that the, the battery compartment on this guy's beacon was pretty corroded, and that's what they attribute to the malfunction. Maybe he would have been able to find the partner quicker had it been functioning, most likely. <clears throat> this is February 4th in Colorado, Marvin's West, another skier that was caught, buried, and killed. Um, this is another uh, side country accident where people were skiing outside of the resort once riding chairlifts. And um, uh, basically uh, one person uh, skied down here through this cliff band and stopped to wait below the cliffs on a small bench for the second skier. The second skier came down 
right in the cliff band triggered an avalanche and and fortunately for that person it was only they were only swept uh, a short ways and only had snow two to three feet up their leg and was upright um, so they were able to un unbury themselves but then they looked down the slope and couldn't see their partner at their meeting at the meeting point um, so she took out the transceiver um, followed a signal and found the person uh, not breathing it took him about 10 minutes to get to the person but that was that was a little bit too long uh, without air um, so the learning point from this is how important it is to anchor up in safe places where if an avalanche did happen you wouldn't be caught um, so thinking about where that could possibly be in this image maybe it was right underneath a cliff where the snow would go around you or you know it's, it's tough on open slopes February 6, Wounded Buck Creek in Montana. Um, five snowmobilers were caught in this accident. One was buried and killed. Uh, unfortunately, we don't know much information about this accident. Um, February 6, the same day in Utah, however, uh, this is probably the most tragic accident that happened this year because four people were buried and killed in this accident. Seven people were actually caught in the avalanche. One was partially buried, two were fully buried, and then four were totally buried. I mean, and, and did not survive. I'll go into a little bit more detail in this avalanche since it's uh, such a significant event. Um, this was in a very popular area to ski. It was fairly mellow terrain. A lot of it was 30 degrees or less. Um, two weeks leading up to this accident, um, they had about 21 inches of new snow with almost two inches of water content. Uh, the leading day and a half, there was uh, over six inches of new snow uh, and wind. Um, the moderate Let's see, the winds were strong from the west to southwest for two days prior, right before the accident, uh, 15 to 30 miles an hour with gusts of 45. Um, <clears throat> here's the, uh, the picture of the avalanche crown. Here's the slope showing probably, I don't know, 14, I think 14 different tracks. So basically there's two different parties involved in this accident. The one party had gotten here and had skied this slope th three times and they were back up, going heading back up for another lap. I'll show you the uh, picture of where this all happened. So they're heading up for another lap, and then another party that they didn't know were there was there came up behind them. Um, so this party, uh, the first party, was going back up to here. One person in this group was waiting on the ridge line. They didn't feel like skiing back down and coming back up, so they were just resting up here. Um, but this party got to this point here, and they regrouped because they knew that this part was a steeper part of this. this this slope. So they went across one at a time um, when the avalanche was triggered. And down here, um, the two skiers were waiting up here for their third partner. Uh, and so they were down this slope. It was only like a 21 degree slope where they were waiting. Um, this avalanche was triggered. It, it took everyone. Um, yeah, it's captured everybody. It buried, um, as it said, um, quite a few of them. One was only partially buried and was able to get himself out and then continue the search. I buried the first person. The person was had snow in the mouth. Um, they were able to assist in the rescue or search for the rest of the victims. Um, but they, they, these two guys, these three guys were able to you know, basically uncover two people that weren't, weren't dead and, and the rest of them, the four, four others, unfortunately, uh, died of asphyxiation. Um, Here's a, a, a diagram of slope angles on this slope, and you can see like 23 degrees, 25 degrees, these 27 degrees, these are all low angles where you don't expect to be on avalanches, but terrain above, as you can see, 40 degrees, 37 degrees, that's steeper, and that's where stuff came down and triggered the rest of this. <clears throat> um, of note too, this is all on the uphill track again, um, and so, these four skiers that, that died in this, unfortunately, their skis were all still on their feet. Um, when they're locked up in, in walk mode, it's hard for, oops, what happened there? Sorry about that. Um, for the skis to release. Um, it's hard to say if, if the skis had released off their feet, uh, maybe they wouldn't have been buried as deeply. Um, maybe they would have been able to stay closer to the surface. But it's hard to not have your skis in lock mode when you're going uphill. Um, it just shows how important it is to pick the safest uphill route you can. And here's a sad picture. These are all the people who died in that avalanche, all young folks. And um, 
not that any, you know, every single one of these tragedies has a, a, a face and a family and friends that are left behind. So these are all really sad events. Um, the next one occurred February 8th, Knox Creek in Washington. Uh, two snow bikers were caught. One was buried and killed. This is a bigger avalanche, R3D3. Um, they both had AVI gear on. They both had airbags. Um, um, but they were both caught and the airbags still didn't keep on the surface. Um, they were found, uh, well actually, so one was, one was buried, one was still there, but unfortunately um, the person that was buried, uh, even though they both had transceivers, the one that was buried, his beacon was off. So this shows just the importance of checking every single time you go out to make sure your beacon is on. It's, last year there was at least a couple of fatalities where people were buried where their beacon was on their body, but off. February 14th, Mount Trelease in Colorado. Not sure if I'm pronouncing that name right. Um, one backcountry snowboarder caught partially buried critical. Partially buried critical means that their head was underneath the snow so they couldn't breathe um, and then was killed from asphyxiation. Um, this is a persistent, again, slab. This is a hard slab, R4D3, so a very, you know, considerably large avalanche. And the crown at the highest point was actually 20 feet high. So that was a pretty immense wind-loaded slab up there. Um, this is a solo snowboarder, um, and he was ascending with an airbag, uh, but no beacon. Um, there was other people coming up to ski this area shortly after him and saw the avalanche, um, and they through various back and forth and calling and uh, they found his car in the parking lot and the sheriff was able to uh, find the person's phone and ping the, the cell phone and they were actually able to zero in on the guy using his cell phone signal and then probe and find him and he was only buried underneath a foot of snow. Um, so had he been with a partner and had a transceiver, um, likely he could have been, been recovered alive. Same day, Valentine's Day, February 14th, Beehive Basin, Montana. This one, two snow, uh, split boilers were caught. One was partially buried and killed. Um, another R4, D2.5 avalanche with a two foot crown. Uh, these are experienced riders as well. One of them at least had an AVI 1 um, uh, under his belt. They both read the forecast that morning and they both decided, let's keep it mellow. It's, it's moderate danger, but they weren't trying to push things. Um, they're partway up this 35 degree slope. They're following a previous skin track. And at that point, um, it was blown over. So they had to start making their own skin track. Um, they were about, again, um, partway up the slope when they, when they heard the collapse and triggered the avalanche. Um, in this slide, uh, neither of them were buried. Um, however, one had a severe open femur fracture and uh, he, still alive when they make, got him to the hospital, but he died in the hospital from his, from the trauma. February 14th, again, uh, Valentine's Day, Pump House Lake, Colorado. This is a father and son snowmobiling. Um, you can see this picture. This is actually a lake at the bottom of this slope here. And they're going out here um, and they were high marking this slope <clears throat> one at a time. Um, so the father uh, went up and high marked and wasn't turning directly down the slope and he triggered an avalanche and he got swept into the lake. It actually broke the ice somewhat. Uh, so it was slushy, uh, fully buried. Actually, it was about a, a foot of snow and he had a boot showing above the surface. Um, these pair didn't have transceivers. Um, not they would have helped in this instance as, as there was a boot showing and his son was able to get to him relatively quickly. Um, he got to the, the father and the father was actually conscious, um, but he was stuck between the, the tunnel of the snowmobile, which is the back seat essentially and the track. He was caught up inside there and the son couldn't get him out in time. And uh, he died of asphyxiation and another person nearby was able to come and help dislodge the body. February 16th, Ruby Mountain, Colorado. <clears throat> this is two snow wheelers caught. One was partially buried and one was fully buried and killed. This is a huge avalanche. This is a persistent hard slab again, R4, D3 is dimensions. It was over three quarters of a mile long. This whole ridge line ripped out from one trigger point. Um, this happened with a group of six uh, snow wheelers. Um, some of them had transceivers, some of them didn't. 
there was a few shovels in the group and one probe for the entire group. So they had some avalanche safety gear, but definitely not enough for the whole group. Um, they were aware of dangerous conditions um, and they discussed and agreed several times through the day that they were gonna avoid steep slopes. Uh, they didn't read the bulletin, but they had at least enough sense to see the forecast, the, the weather forecast and the conditions. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. So this is the slope and this, this picture here with the red and the yellow, this is indicating slope steepnesses. The yellow is uh, like 30, just over 30 degrees. Orange is steeper, red is even steeper still. And below that is not color colored, that's less than 30 degree slope steepness. Um, so an avalanche just on the 30 degree slope, or I mean less than a 30 degree slope, probably wouldn't happen if there's not train above. But this blue spot, he was right underneath this steeper slope and triggered the avalanche above him and got dragged down. Um, what happened actually is this snowmobiler got stuck on the slope up here and was trying to dig a sled out. And then two or three of the snow snowmobilers went by and did passes next to him to try to help him. Oops, I'm sorry. Um, and he finally did get unstuck. And so he was there standing by his sled, getting ready to get back on when the fourth snowmobiler just came by to say hi. And that fourth snowmobiler actually triggered the slope and, and ended up burying him. Um, he didn't have a transceiver on. Um, and you know they only had one trans a shovel and one probe between them all, and so it was actually the next the next day that a SAR search and rescue dog uh, was able to find him, and he was buried two feet deep. February seventeenth, Squaw Creek, Wyoming, another snowmobiler caught, buried, and killed. This is another persistent lab, uh, soft slab avalanche. Um, you can see the picture here um, of the snowmobile tracks. So basically today, this day, a group of nine experienced snowmobilers who were very familiar with the terrain and avalanche conditions uh, headed out. Um, these these uh, riders had put a lot of tracks high marking the slope already. And this, this was triggered by a rider coming in from the top of the slope. Um, and it caught all but one member of the group. Um, fortunately, it didn't bury them all. Um, one person was fully buried under four to five feet of debris and three others were buried with just uh, their, their basically faces and helmets above. Um, they were able to self-rescue, um, but the person that was fully buried, um, they weren't able to get into them, to him in time, and um, he died of asphyxiation. <clears throat> February 18th, Tagwati Pass, Wyoming. One snowboarder, snow, one snowboarder was buried and killed. This is a little more interesting, a little different scenario here. If you can see on this picture, this is a, a steep, steep slope into a stream bed but right up here there's a jump so there are six snowboarders that came out and built this big jump this kicker uh to go session and, and land on this steep slope the first person the first snowboarder to hit it went off and triggered this avalanche um it's about a three to four foot deep crown and it, again persistent slab so it failed on weak layers um and he was buried nine feet deep in the bottom of this slope which is too deep for people to unbury him alive. February 19th, Smiley Creek, Idaho. Uh, one snowmobiler was buried and killed in this avalanche. Um, this is actually on a south-facing slope, one of the few avalanches that occurred this year on a south-facing slope that resulted in a fatality. Most of the others were more on shady aspects, but this actually happened on a, a melt-freeze facet combination. So there was a melt-freeze frozen layer and then, uh, then there was a small layer of snow above it that faceted and got weak and then more snow fell on top of that. Uh, this is a large group of 25 experienced riders that were out this day. And, and one of them um, was heading out uh, into this edge of this gully and he got, he triggered the avalanche and got caught. Um, he had an airbag on, uh, which kept him on the surface um, of the snow, even though it was above this train trap and, and the debris in the train trap was 20 to 30 feet deep the airbag in this situation to keep him on the surface, uh, but unfortunately hit trees on the way down and he died of trauma. February 20th, Castle Lake, Nevada. Um, again, we don't see a lot of fatalities in Nevada. It's not a very uh, populous area, but two, two snowmobilers were caught. Uh, one was buried and killed. Uh, one was injured with a broken leg. Um, they didn't have transceivers, rescue gear. The, the injured one was able to get out and get cell service and was rescued by a helicopter. And they came back the next day. Um, and that's when they were able to uncover the other person's body. 
So this one, uh, this is Show Me Peak, Idaho. And uh, this is February 20th. Uh, this guy um, was killed in this avalanche. And there's a video, I think, that shows the whole sequence of the day, which I think is a valuable thing to see. So I'll show that. Alan Foss of Preston, Idaho, was killed by an avalanche Saturday, February 20th, 2021, while riding in the backcountry near Sherman Peak, northwest of Montpelier, Idaho. Our condolences go out to the friends and family of the victim and those involved with the rescue. Three snowmobilers headed out for a ride from the Copenhagen Basin parking area in Emigration Canyon Saturday morning, February 20th, 2021. Alan Foss, age 48, Doug Saxton, age 50, and Doug's son, Mason, 22, rode towards the Sherman Peak area about 10 miles to the north. The group mostly stayed in the trees and avoided open slopes and gullies during their ride. The party approached the east side of Sherman Peak from the south. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Where's Alan? Alan, can you hear me? I'm good. At around 11 o'clock in the morning on February 20th, the Bear Lake County Sheriff's Office was notified of an avalanche accident in the area of the east side of Sherman Peak, west of Georgetown, Idaho. A snowmobile rider was buried in the large avalanche. Search and rescue units from Bear Lake County, Caribou County, and Franklin County responded to the area. In addition to search and rescue, there happened to be an avalanche class nearby the class was able to provide much assistance with the rescue effort. Hey, Charlotte, we're just trying to clear people out of here. We're looking back out. We'll be people coming back in here. Hey, Charlotte, we're just trying to clear people out of here. We're in Sherman's chute, and you can see where it broke, and the whole shoot slid you can see where the avalanche is right down through the middle right over here it's not so anyways not a good day alan was found under 12 feet of heavy snow in an upright seated position a few feet uphill but below his sled which was buried flipped on its side nose facing down slope We've got this big slab here of wind loaded snow from the last storm. It's about 100 centimeters thick. And then down below, what we've been looking at all year, we've got faceted snow, that weak, sugary snow all over the place. It's super weak. So when this snow settled on top, all it needed was a trigger to come up and create the avalanche. See that? Despite the heroic effort made by the rescuers, Alan did not survive the avalanche.
So I think that <clears throat> I think that video does a good job of showing just the immensity of snow that can be carried and how deeply someone can be buried. Um, so February um, 22nd, this is in Wyoming, a place called 25 Short, the Tetons, one, snowboard, uh, one snowboarder was buried and killed here. This is a soft wind slab this time. Um, so this didn't actually involve a persistent one of the few that didn't this in this, uh, this series. Um, basically a group of three uh, were, were climbing this mountain and they were above this first choke uh, in the Broken Thumb Couloir. <clears throat> when a snowboarder triggered this, this small wind slab avalanche and um, it's carried through both of these chokes uh, over a cliff that they would have to repel if they were actually gonna descend it. Um, and he did not survive. February 27th, and this brings us to just last week um, and the final avalanche uh, of this season, hopefully of the season. Um, so four snowmobilers were caught in this avalanche. Uh, one was buried and one was uh, buried and killed. Um, There's again a persistent slab avalanche with a four foot crown and it failed actually on a December, a February 6th buried layer of surface ore. Uh, so this wasn't those early facets from earlier in the beginning of the season, but this is more mid season where a, a buried layer of weak surface ore was uh, the responsible culprit here. <clears throat> we don't know a whole lot about this avalanche. So our sincere condolences are extended to all the family and friends and communities surrounding these tragic events. Um, it's, it's very hard for everyone involved and connected when these things kind of things happen. So here's just uh, an overview of the learning points and takeaways from some of these avalanches. Um, importantly, know and understand the terrain that you're in and when that's above you and, and the importance of recognizing what is avalanche terrain and what is 30 degrees, what is that? magic number where slopes can actually slide and also being aware of what's above you. And just because you're on not steep terrain doesn't mean an avalanche can't affect you. <clears throat> it's important to carry the gear, the beacon and shovel and probe. Um, many did in these accidents, but many did not. And they could have uh, helped people survive. Um, checking your beacons, making sure they're on every single time, doing a check making sure your batteries are good and making sure they're fastened to you. There was one actually avalanche in this series where a snowmobiler had an avalanche transceiver, but it fell out of his pocket sometime between when um, he left the parking lot and when he was uncovered. Um, minimizing exposure in the uptrack is really important if there's dangerous or suspect conditions at all, really putting that skin track in a place as safe as it can be. Because when your skis are locked on your feet, and there's multiple people at a time. Usually when you're on an up track with other people, they're not spread out immensely, even though you should be. Um, the importance of exposing one person at a time. So if someone does get caught, the rest of the people can find them uh, and only one person gets caught. Um, releasable bindings sure are nice, but when they're locked on your feet in up mode, it's not really possible. Um, but when you're skiing, to have them in releasable mode and to have your pole straps off your poles so that these things don't uh, it gives you a better chance to be able to get stay on the surface and not get sucked down and buried. Um, and again, important to remember that previous tracks on a slope doesn't mean it's safe. It sure does seem like it's reassuring. Oh, people skied it, it didn't avalanche. But that doesn't mean that they, they didn't hit a, a sweet spot and could have triggered it. So just recognize that. Um, and recognize the consequences of terrain traps like these gully features and how much snow can really build up in them. Even wearing a transceiver, if you're buried underneath 10, 12, 20 feet of snow, that's not gonna do you any good, even if you have 10 of your best friends with shovels. Um, anchoring up in safe places when you're skiing, uh, skiing one at a time and, and finding safe spots to anchor in case an avalanche does happen, you don't get caught by it, and two of you don't get caught. Um, the importance of fast, fast response times um, to practice with those beacon skills and to know that minutes really, even seconds sometimes, uh, can, can affect someone's survival and being able to get someone within two minutes as opposed to five minutes, um, 10 minutes, uh, really get those skills dialed down. Airbags can help sometimes. A lot of these avalanche fatalities had involved people wearing airbags um, and they still died. So they are not some sort of foolproof, like I'm wearing an airbag, come get me avalanche, I'll be all good. Uh, as you can see, that's definitely not the case. You still have to make smart decisions. Um, and finally, uh, respect the avalanche danger and the unknowns. Like if these persistent slab problems are out there, those are some of the scariest 
that there can be. And you really have to give them a wide berth and respect. And finally, just because you're educated and experienced doesn't mean that'll save you from avalanches. Um, there's tons of examples in these slides where people were very educated and very experienced and they still got caught in avalanches. So it's the decision making um, that occurs after your avalanche education and experience that is always important. So um, is it an avalanche problem or a human problem? Um, as you can see, the, the dangerous conditions are out there, but if no one was out there playing in the hills, no one would have been killed. So this is more of a human problem than an avalanche problem. This is dangerous terrain that people are choosing to go into, sometimes knowingly, sometimes unknowingly. Um, why do people go into the backcountry? And there's a whole lot of different reasons. Um, you know, that feeling of rushing air by your face, out in the hills, that's one reason. Maybe smooth turns, uh, whether it be powder or corn, just that feeling of flow down a hill, it's hard to beat. Um, the adrenaline rush from skiing some sort of steep couloir or going really fast, and you know, we, we get high off of that. We, we get feel happy, we feel a rush. There's, there's this hormone going through our body that's uh, making us feel good. Come out with friends, it's a great way to go out and spend time with friends. It's a great way to escape from friends and, <laughs> and life and just find some alone time and escape from society and kind of get recharged. Um, challenges and goals, uh, you know, climbing peaks and pushing yourself. Um, that's why a lot of people do this. Um, mastering skills. There's a lot of like skiing skills and snowboarding skills to, to master reading snowpack and being safe and mastering all those skills. And finally, just, you know, the beauty of being out in nature. There's probably a lot more reasons that people go out in the backcountry as well. So what motivates you to push closer to the line? So you're out in the backcountry, you can go out in the backcountry every day of the year in low angle terrain and not worry about avalanches, but what motivates you to go into that steeper terrain, that riskier terrain when it might not be the safest conditions? Um, everyone's risk perception and risk tolerance is different. Um, lots of you out there may be thinking like, there's no need for me to ever go ski in avalanche terrain. You know, I'm totally happy cross country skiing or cruising around mellow slopes. I can do that for my whole life and I'm a-okay and happy. Other people want to push it. Other people find the thrill in skiing steeper lines and the enjoyment and that outweighs some of the risks. Um, there's risks in all kinds of things we do in life. And so I think we really need to be respectful of, of people's differences and how, how, one person's sense of risk is maybe not the other person's. <clears throat> um, so finally, in terms of risk, it's really important to differentiate between risks that we are in control of and risks that are out of our control. Um, subjective risks, meaning the risks that we are in control of uh, that aren't relying on some sort of freak of nature, uh, include like seeing a steep line with stable snow. I mean, the snow is stable and there's no hidden obstacles. Seeing that steep line is all about our abilities and uh, our, our skills and, and mastering that and being able to navigate our way down steep slopes. Um, that's really dependent on our skills and we can really have a good sense of like, am I good enough to do this? Um, and we can it be, you know, rely on our confidence level and our feelings to, to guide us. Um, rock climbing on solid rock, you know, if, if the rock isn't going to break on you, rock climbing can actually be a pretty safe activity if you know your level. Um, you know, one person, of course, uh, may not be the same as another person, some, but with that skill, you know your level and you know what's comfortable about pushing yourself and when it's not. Objective risks, on the other hand, could be skiing a slope with a persistent weak layer. Like you can have all the skills in the world, um, but, and you might be able to ski a slope with a persistent weak layer 10 times, but that 11th time, you might hit that weak point and trigger it and cause an avalanche and get caught in it. So that's an objective hazard in a way. Uh, possible rock fall in a couloir, like you're climbing up a couloir and, you know, rock fall can happen all the time in couloirs. It doesn't that often, but when people are in it, but it does. And two years ago, there was a tragedy in, in Red Slate couloir where two women were killed by rock fall climbing up this in the summertime. So these are objective hazards where they're just out there and you basically rely on probability. Like how likely is something going to affect you? Rock fall in a couloir? Well, it's, it's always a slight possibility. Maybe on a warm day after snowfall, uh, it's a better possibility that things might get knocked loose. Um, but it's something we, we calculate basically like, ah, oh, there's a low percent chance or a medium percent chance. Is it worth that chance to go into here even though it's something I can't control? <clears throat> That's something we have to think about, especially with persistent layers in the snowpack. 
So how can we make better decisions in avalanche terrain? <clears throat> um, this is probably the, <laughs> I wish there was a, an answer I could give you that worked all the time, except for staying out of avalanche terrain. Um, but there's a process that can help you. Um, and that starts with reading the avalanche advisory before you go out in the morning. Um, so here's, I'm gonna give you some examples of advisories and uh, just kind of walk you through them a little bit. So here's one from um, a while back where the avalanche danger was moderate at tree line and above and low below tree line. And the primary avalanche problem was wind slab on these aspects, um, on these Northwest through Southeast, even South aspects at medium, medium middle and upper elevations. Uh, the likelihood was possible and the size was small to large. Um, so just looking at that, I mean, if, if, we're, if we're doing reliable avalanche advisories, you could go ski below treeline terrain and be in low danger. That doesn't mean no danger. That doesn't mean avalanches can't happen, but that would, you would be able to hedge your bets staying in low elevations. So if you're planning your day, you can stay on low elevations. And if you're going up just to, around treeline, if you stayed on southwest to west, likely because the winds were blowing from that direction, you would find less chance of finding uh, wind slab avalanches here. Here's another day where the considerable avalanche danger exists at treeline and above and moderate at below. Um, but now you can see there's the, the primary problem again, wind slab um, exists on all these slopes at all these elevations, but Southwest and South, this problem is not likely to be found. Um, it's very likely to trigger these avalanches at these upper elevations on these aspects, and it could be a large or very large slide. So if you were gonna go out on this kind of day, um, just because it's a considerable avalanche danger, doesn't mean you can't find somewhere that's safer to ski and you could focus your attention on southwest or south slopes and so when you're making your planning you're like okay if we're going to go out today we're either going to be a mellow terrain or if we're going to go higher we're going to make sure to stay on these southerly southwest facing slopes um, where it might be safer and keep our eyes open as the day progresses and see what we're seeing out there because these avalanche advisories cover a huge area and of course variations occur all over the place um, <clears throat> Now, persistent slab avalanches, which you've talked a lot about, uh, are a whole different, different game. Uh, wind slab avalanches, you can, you can find areas that look like they're wind slabs. You can, you can probe in the snow relatively easily. You can do hand tests. Um, there's a lot of indications that, you can, that, you can, that gives you feedback, whether a wind slab is fresh, whether it's sensitive. Um, but persistent slab avalanches, you need to take your shovel out and dig some deep holes. Um, and they're variable across the slope. You might dig in one place and it might be totally different across the slope. So these are really, really tricky problems to deal with. Um, and basically you just need to have uh, patience and extensive evaluation. So if you're gonna be going out skiing somewhere where um, on this kind of day, you can see that west through south slopes, uh, we're not concerned about persistent problems because of these slopes have probably had sunshine on them a lot and warmed up and those, those weak layers have, uh, are no longer concerning. So if you want to go out on this considerable day, you could uh, stick on these southerly facing slopes and be safe. If you were going to poke around on the other side, you might not want to go above tree line or even near tree line, but staying low in, in mellower terrain and, and having your shovel out and, and, and planning some time to dig some holes and evaluate things as you're going. <clears throat> So planning, I think planning is the number one thing, using the avalanche advisory um, to help you in that and your own experience and knowledge of the area um, is also very important. Um, when we're going out in the, in the backcountry, we're not just trying to stay alive out there. We wanna have fun. You know, we, we like to go ski a steeper line. We like to ski good snow, um, but we do want to come back at the end of the day. Being hurt or, or being killed is not fun for anyone. Um, there's a woman that uh, pre uh, presented at the uh, ISSW this year named Andrea Manberg, a professor of economics, and she had a lot of great things to say about decision making. Um, one thing, there's lots of different things, but one thing that kind of stuck out to me in particular was uh, her research found that people in general really hate to lose more than they actually like to win. Losing can be a lot of different things, but in backcountry skiing, I can think of it as um, planning a day. And like, I've got this idea, this goal in mind, this place I want to go. And if we get out there and we don't do what we went out to plan, we kind of lose. Um, and so I feel like that sense of loss can really lead us to push through things because we don't want to lose. Um, but if you can make a plan B along with your plan A uh, ahead of time, I feel like that can give you an alternative to still winning and not losing. Like, okay, plan A didn't look good, but we got this plan B figured out already. We put this attention and effort towards making it. Um, 
we can still do plan B. So this couloir, we were wanting to go ski today, but uh, we found some evidence of, of, of things we didn't like and made us concerned. So, but we talked about, you know, going up further this canyon and going skiing this, these, this treat slope with nice snow. So let's do that instead. And we come back home and we still feel like we had a great day and we accomplished what we wanted to. So I think making that plan B ahead of time can really help some decision makings during the heat of the moment. <coughs> Also with planning, I think it's really important to set boundaries uh, to figure out based on the avalanche forecasts and your own knowledge of the area, um, what's off limits, what's inappropriate for today. Uh, and then in the same regard, what's, what's, go, what's a go? What's given these conditions, what zones are gonna be a go? And then there's that gray zone in between that where there might be room for negotiation. Um, so, but setting those strict limits to yourself, like, you know what, no, today we might go out there, we might not find signs of instability. They might not be cracking around our skis. There might not be one thing. We might not see blowing snow, but we know some of the history of the weather. So let's just not even play with this zone where, where there's some unknowns going on and, and sticking to that. Um, <clears throat> but when you go out in the field, there's a, there's a constant process going on. So you plan the day in the beginning and I think taking that extra effort to really see what's going on out there, uh, taking in all the different variables that you can find, the avalanche forecast advisory, is a, it's a strong one. Um, but once you head out, then your eyes are open. You're seeing what's out there, you're seeing the weather, you're seeing how the snow feels, you're seeing the, you know, digging holes and looking at the depth of the snow and the layers. <clears throat> you're looking for red flags, you're looking for the winds picking up, you're looking for higher sunshine, less clouds than maybe you expected. And you're digging holes and looking at the weak layers. Um, and then you're seeing that. And then as you're going with other people or yourself, you're communicating, you're, you're, you're checking in with yourself, checking in with others. How do you guys feel? Let's talk about this. Uh, and then you adjust your plans accordingly. Maybe what you see is telling you green light, go to what your goal was and you keep on moving ahead. But maybe it's telling you <clears throat> otherwise and you need to start changing your plan to more conservative choices. Or maybe everything you're seeing out there is making that gray zone. You know what, we're worried about this, but everything we're seeing isn't leading us to believe that there's gonna be wind slabs on this slope here today that we're gonna be worried about. So we can go in there and maybe check that out a little bit more. Um, but then also realize uh, this, this notion called present bias preference. And that's another Andrea um, item that she presented on is basically what we as humans are experiencing right now uh, it can feel a lot more important than what we might experience in the future. So this feeling of like, ooh, if we get over here and ski this cool slope, it's gonna feel great right now. Even though there's a slight possibility we might get hurt or, or, or worse, uh, and that would really affect our future. Um, just realize the power of that right now feeling uh, is, is very important and to keep yourself in check. And to realize also that the greater the uncertainty is out there, the greater margin for error you need to give yourself. How close do you want to ride to that line? If you're really certain about the conditions, then you can ride kind of close to that line. But if there's some uncertainty involved, you want to give away from that line. And, away th and that line is typically terrain choice. Um, steeper terrain is getting close to that line. So stick to lower angle terrain if there's some uncertainty and things you're not sure about stick to less consequential terrain. So if, you know, a, a, a slope with a gentle run out at the bottom instead of above a terrain trap or, or slope that doesn't have cliffs in it or trees that you might get raked through if an avalanche happened or different aspects, you know, potentially you were, you were thinking about skiing a, a southerly aspect and you got out there and boy, it's a lot warmer. The snow is getting manky. Let's go ditch that idea and go ski a northerly aspect where there's no concern about snow warming. Um, so again, just giving yourself a margin for error and changing your plans is, is very important. Um, I wish there was some way before I get into this season of snowfall of, of some framework that you could follow precisely every time. Like, okay, given these, these, these variables, uh, let's plug these in the equations. It will feed us back out some answer of whether we can go or no go. Uh, and that, that, there are lots of frameworks out there and you can Google that. And there's plenty that you can look at for when you're getting into skiing and when you're at sort of at the more beginner level. But there's been a lot of research done for more experienced and advanced skiers that these frameworks really aren't followed very often. Um, so this is something that's, you know, you really have to get to know yourself and what's gonna motivate you. Um, <coughs> There's a lot of, a lot of these people were educated and experienced that were caught in these avalanches. And there's maybe some, you know, debate about like, does the education and experience help people in avalanche train? 
or does it give them this sense of uh, they can outsmart the avalanche problem? Um, okay, I know all this about the avalanche problem, and this is what we're worried about, but I can, I can know enough that I can like, be aware of where I could find this problem, and I can stay on these trees in this slightly low angle slope, and it might get people into more trouble than it actually helps being more educated as opposed to a beginner going out and just knowing like, it just snowed yesterday, it snowed a bunch, and that slope is steep. I'm not getting anywhere near it. Um, and, you know, taking a step back and going to the basics uh, for the Sierras, you hear that 48 hours, you know, don't go to ski steep terrain within the first two days after a big storm. Uh, and just going by that one guideline can, can help a lot. There's, of course, other problems and winds that pick up. But um, some of the simplicity is really what helps people more than trying to, trying to navigate and trying to understand and outsmart all the complexities that could exist. So um, talk briefly here now about our season snowpack in the Sierra. All these avalanches that we've talked about so far were in other parts of the country. Um, not to say that avalanches haven't occurred here, but fortunately no fatalities and we hope to keep it that way. Um, so I'll just go through this rather briefly. Uh, this is a snowfall based on time. These two little blips here in the beginning, um, this one here in the middle of November and then towards the end of November, this is what lets snow on the ground uh, after, after it snowed, there's this big dry period where it didn't snow. And this snow right here is what faceted and what led to this weak layer that we too were worried about in the Sierra <clears throat> and across the whole country. Um, it, it, they saw similar patterns. So we had these little bits of snowfall, a long dry period led to um, faceting snow, these crystals like this in the snowpack that was weak on the base. After that, it snowed a good bit in December. Uh, well, a good bit is relative. It's, it snowed some in December, but then we had this long stretch all the way to the end of January where it was really bleak. I mean, there wasn't even a base of snow to ski on in many places. It was just bushes and we were not very psyched to be in the Sierra. But then the end of January came and then boom, huge snowfall happened. Almost 100 inches of snow around Mammoth fell within a, a number of days. And then all of a sudden the season went from like barely scratching by to all of a sudden everything is in. Uh, it was fantastic. But don't forget these two little weak layers, two little weak snowstorms back here that left this weak layer at the bottom of the snowpack. <clears throat> this is this big storm that happened late January, this big blob of purple, which we don't often see, lots and lots of snow coming down. Um, so right after or during this storm, here's a picture of an avalanche crown on Mammoth Mountain. For those of you that are familiar with the dragon tail, that goes basically all above chair nine from the tree line all the way through the trees to the end. There was an avalanche that ripped out basically from the Wadzoo area, which is kind of that right past the head shoots all the way through the whole tail to Old Faithful. And this crown, I mean, no one in ski patrol has ever seen it rip out like this. And this is fairly sheltered terrain in, in trees right below a ridge line. Um, so we went out and checked this out. Again, this is the faceted layer from those early storms. And there was a, another faceted layer that happened right uh, a little bit higher from December snowfall after it stayed dry for so long. <coughs> and this is, you've probably, many of you have heard about the avalanche that happened in Pucha Bardini on January 30th, right after this huge storm where a skier, um, triggered an avalanche at the beginning of these slopes up here and was, and the avalanche went down all the way through the bottom. Fortunately, he was able to grab onto a tree uh, fairly high up and sustained some injuries and had to be hospitalized. Um, but fortunately, he was not killed and he'll be skiing again. Um, but this is, this is one of those that, that failed on these persistent facets that we were worried about. And um, we kept worrying about them for some time after this, even though we didn't have any other accidents occur. Um, but Typically, right after a big snow event, um, that's when these layers of any kind of weakness are really going to show their colors and be of concerning. Once things settle out for a few days, they'll be less and less possible to trigger. Not that they're impossible, but they won't be quite as sensitive. <coughs> so now we are basically not concerned about this persistent layer at the moment because it hasn't snowed forever. Um, and we sure wish it does snow soon. Um, but that weak layer is still down there. And a lot of places it is strengthening and it's, be, it's super unlikely that it could be triggered at this point. But if we had another huge dump, it would be on our radars again. We would be digging down there and we could be concerned again. It could re reignite and, 
and causes problems. Um, it's just something we don't know at this point. But currently, over the last couple of weeks, the winds have been blowing, blowing snow around, small wind slides have been forming. So that is, that's been our main avalanche concerns. Combined <coughs> with minor loose wet concerns, it's been really nice, warm, sunny days um, for a while now. Not hot, but you know, it's been sunny and it's, it feels like springtime when you're in the sun and the wind isn't blowing. Um, and the nights have been really cold. They've been, they've been quite cold and clear, which has been really freezing up that snowpack really well, um, which is good for stability. Um, and so when the day's warm and the southerly, southerly solar aspects are warming up, there's these minor loose wet avalanches that could happen, some sloughs essentially, um, but they haven't been too concerning. Uh, and we've been in low danger for, for uh, over a week and a half at this point in time. Uh, as you can see, there's firm conditions. Crampons are a great idea to have in many places, the ski crampons and ice axes. Um, even in you know, sheltered terrain, there's a lot of firm surfaces out there. Um, there's also a lot of faceting going on in the snowpack. These cold, clear nights have been creating surface facets. So that same, same principle is happening at the top of the snowpack now, basically faceting out this top layer, making it, making it feel like it's almost fresh snow in some places. Uh, which is great for riding conditions where there's not ski tracks. Um, but once we get another big storm, there could be a whole other weak layer involved that could be that could be very concerning. So that's another thing we're keeping an eye out, and uh, we'll we'll see. And and hopefully it's something we'll have to worry about with some more snow. Hopefully we we get some still. And March will doesn't look to be like a miracle yet, but it hopefully will be. So finally, um, check out our Avalanche website, esavalanche.org. Um, we update advisories every morning at 7 a.m. Uh, we have lots of observations on the site that you can check out for more specific conditions in specific areas and see what people are seeing. Uh, we really encourage you guys to submit your observations when you're out there. We are only three forecasters and we have a group of dedicated volunteer observers, um, but boy, it's such a huge range. Uh, your observations are hugely important. So please um, take the time to, to go to our website after you get out and submit what you see out there. It doesn't have to be much. You can get as deep into details as you want, or you can go pretty, pretty low detail and, and just provide, you know, yeah, it was windy today at this elevation. Um, don't be, you know, some of these observations are, get pretty advanced, um, but don't be dissuaded uh, and discouraged that yours have to be like that necessarily. Um, and finally, there's a little support button. Uh, if you feel in the mood, um, we're always eager for support. We're a nonprofit organization and uh, the money helps do what we do. So finally, thank you all for joining um, and do your snow dances and stay safe out there. Um, and if you have any questions, I'd be psyched to try to answer them as well as anyone else on the, on the line, Steve or Mike, if you might. Yeah, Josh, we have a, a few that are trickling in in the Q&A section. Um, one related to Avalanche Rescue, and uh, Michael is wondering if there's any tech out there involving drones um, and transceivers that could help pinpoint somebody when an avalanche occurs. Do you know anything about that? I don't know too much about drones. I know about helicopters. They, they, they can search with a... Uh, a RECO device that's attached to them, which, which basically reflects off of devices um, that patches that people have in their clothing. But boy, drones, I've heard of drones going out and doing some prelimin preliminary uh, searching, but I haven't heard them actually taking a transceiver out there or a RECO device. But I, boy, I, I sure would expect that in the near future if it isn't already happening somewhere. Does anyone else have, Steve or anyone else heard of anything like that? Um, I have not heard um, anything about finding transceivers with a helicopter. I think part of the problem is you need to be within a certain range of the beacon itself. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the RECO for sure. I've definitely known, have, have been involved with search and rescues who have used drones um, for their camera to survey a scene, looking for visual clues and things like that, um, which has been, has proved to be helpful on, you know, bigger search areas. Um, but yeah, not, as far as I know, the beacon is, is really only useful for person to person searching. Josh, uh, we have another great question related to 
uh, persistent weak layers, um, given that that was such a theme in avalanche accidents this year. Um, and Jason, uh, Jacob is asking about um, a couple weeks ago, our um, persistent weak layer here in the Eastern Sierra was considered to be uh, mostly dormant um, and not noted in forecasts at some point. And he's wondering if you could explain a little bit more about how and why a persistent weak layer like ours uh, goes dormant and why it's not included in the forecast at some point. And that's that's a great that's a great question, and uh, it's it's basically um, comes down to the time that's 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 gone by and the activities that we're seeing. Uh, I know that persistent weak layers don't show the obvious signs once they've been around for a bit. They don't slopes won't crack, they won't warmth anymore, but they'll still be there. And we still do our tests out there, and we are still finding snow pit tests propagating. Uh, on that deep layer. So it's this weak layer is still there. Um, but at this point in time, we feel comfortable enough given all the observations we've made um, <clears throat> that the snowpack is basically compensated for itself, that it's basically stable, you know, it's, it, there's enough settled structure on there that it, it's, it's not, it's super unlikely for an avalanche to be triggered on that deeper layer at this point in time. Um, it's interesting, like our snowpack compared to the Rockies, uh, how, how long they can persist out there. Like, you know, for weeks and months even, there can be a layer that's still causing avalanches um, after it's been buried for months. Uh, and we just have never really seen that here in the Sierra. I think some of that has to do with just, uh, it's not quite as cold. We don't have quite as shallow a snowpack, um, but it's a tricky one. And it's one that us forecasters wrestle with every single time that we get a persistent layer that we're worried with. We bring it up and then we're, we're debating back and forth. Like, well, is it time to drop it yet? Is it still something we're concerned? Yeah, it's there. Uh, is it, is it a, really a chance that a human could trigger this at this point? Um, so it's, it's a, it's a tough, it's a tough problem for us, but, uh, but there comes a time where we feel pretty comfortable that it's just so unlikely um, that it's time to drop it and focus attention on things that are more potentially dangerous. <clears throat> Steve, do you have anything more to add to that? I know it, this is a, this is a tough one. Yeah, it is a tough one. I think, um, one thing that might, is important to reiterate that Josh mentioned is, is I guess focuses on the difference between a weak, persistent weak layer and a persistent slab problem. And when we, are evaluating the hazard or yeah, the hazard around a specific problem. Um, kind of like Josh mentioned, there is a point where the, the stress needed to trigger that weak layer um, grows after a certain amount of time. And so we kind of stop seeing the persistence lab problem, but that doesn't mean the weak layer has gone away. So if we saw another big snowstorm, um, that could kind of re bring that problem back on the same weak layer. Um, so just because the problem has um, gone away for now, doesn't mean it won't come back, I guess. And yeah, so I guess that's, I just wanted to reiterate that point, Josh, that you had made earlier, but um, yeah, it doesn't, you know, once the persistent weak layer is there, it's, you know, it's, it's there for a long time and we're, we still see, even now, um, today, I dug a hole and those weak facets are still at the base of the snowpack. So, and in some areas they've, you know, continued to grow in size. So it doesn't mean they've gone away, uh, but the other factors have reduced the risk of a human triggering that avalanche. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that provides some clarity there. Um, Regarding the avalanche forecast and kind of looking forward into the future a little bit, um, maybe you can speak to the new format of the, the avalanche forecast, Josh. We have a question regarding um, looking towards the next day and making plans based off of a forecast that was issued that morning. And I know the new format has a, an outlook that might give some some help to folks who are getting up early in the morning and need a little bit of a head start on the forecast for the day. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, for those of you that don't know, our forecast platform changed um, not too long ago to a slightly different format that's going to be adopted more nationally. So we're trying to be consistent. 
and that does include uh, an outlook for the next day past today's uh, danger ratings. <clears throat> and so those, those are made, um, you know, things can change sometimes not at all from one day to the next, and sometimes they can change very, very dramatically from one day to the next. So that, that is to help, again, you know, give people a little bit more planning tool to go and forward because I know, boy, if people are trying to ski sunny aspects right now, you'll probably be up and out of the door before advisory comes out. And so that, that is the point of, to try to help that planning, but also to realize that uh, we're not, we don't give many details because it's, it, things change a lot, you know, within, you know, half a day, the weather might change a bit and the forecast will change. Um, but we are liking the new forecast format. I hope, hope you do too. It, it takes a little bit getting used to potentially. Um, and we're going to be, you know, trying to be more on the conservative side with the outlook. So if we, we see like a, a snowstorm coming up, you know, tomorrow night um, that has potential for, for, you know, increasing hazard, we'll probably show that potential the morning, the day before. We'll err on the side of uh, being safer to up the danger. Uh, so people will look at it again the next morning um, as opposed to like, well, the snowstorms, they sometimes come, they sometimes don't. Um, if there's, we'll probably err on more in the uncertainty and, and, and give it a boost so that it'll keep people's attention and to look at it. So I wish we could provide a whole bunch more information and there's times where we don't provide daily avalanche bulletins and we, when we do like a two or three day outlook. Um, and it's, it's tough to include so much information and keep it concise and, and, not, ex, and not expand or not go beyond people's attention span. Um, not sure if that answers your question completely. Uh, and again, Steve, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think you covered it very well. Josh, as far as what's available in, in the Avalanche Advisory that ESAC puts out, I think you spoke really well to, um, you know, as those persistent weak layers start to gain strength or um, a lack of avalanche activity leads you to take it off of the, the forecast list of problems. Um, I think that speaks to the low likelihood, high consequence potential there. And there's a good question here regarding the, the low danger avalanche in New Hampshire that happened on a, on a low, low danger day. Um, and Alex is asking about um, what is included in the advisory as far as the expected avalanche type, the location and the size available for the day. Um, and he sort of highlights that uh, fatality on a low danger day is pretty eye-opening. Is there anything you can speak to as far as what's included and how that's communicated? Yeah, thanks, thanks very much for that question. I'm, I'm glad you asked it. Um, yeah, the definition of low avalanche is, low avalanche danger isn't, it, it's not that no avalanches are going to occur. It's that isolated, that they'll be isolated and small. Um, and so that really, people really need to remember that, that we can't almost ever say that there's no avalanche danger out there. There's definitely levels of like low, low avalanche danger and kind of low, high, you know, upper level, low avalanche danger. Um, and some days we'll be, we'll, we'll, we will have problems about like, yeah, low avalanche danger, but uh, in the definition, you know, in extreme terrain up in upper elevations, small avalanches are quite, are, are possible. There wouldn't be, out of the realm of possible, you know, they wouldn't even make us consider, oh, maybe we should have gone moderate that day because someone triggered an avalanche. It's like, no, that's a low avalanche danger day. And that kind of avalanche can happen. Um, so that green light, green, green means go, doesn't mean you have to like turn your brain off and be like, oh, yep, it's green. That means I can go anywhere I want, do anything I, I, I want. And if an avalanche happens, boy, those guys really messed up. Um, so I think it's just, it's just, it, it's a different level of how severe it can be, how widespread it is. Um, and like, and each level expands upon that. Moderate level is a huge range of avalanche conditions. Moderate, boy, from one end to the next can be extremely different. And so I think that's why it's really so important to, to read the avalanche problems in the discussion so you can really dilute, dilute and distill uh, what the real concerns might still be. Is it going to be like a, a, a slope warming in a small isolated area or is it going to be a small wind slab somewhere? Um, hope that answers your question a bit. And uh, Steve, any, anything to add? Yeah, I think one thing to think about with with the danger rating and different when with different avalanche problem types, you know, I think the different factors within that um, assessment kind of 
get weighted differently. So for instance, you know, if we have a low danger, loose wet or wind slab hazard, you know, we, it's easier to kind of use the size of a potential slide to help make that assessment. But with something like a persistent slab issue, um, which a lot of those fatalities were, um, you know, it's, it's really more the likelihood and the distribution comes more into how, where is it, where are you going to be able to trigger it? Um, but it, you can't really take the size down, I suppose. So um, as that persistent slab issue kind of gains strength or maybe, maybe a better way to say that is losing the sort of sensitivity of it. Um, it just, it, it, it doesn't mean it's not going to be big if it does happen. And that's, I think, where that problem is particularly tricky for us as forecasters to, to, you know, when we start to drop that hazard on it, it is kind of spooky because it's like Mike mentioned that low likelihood, but high consequence um, scenarios is, is for me as a backcountry skier, one of the scarier ones to be dealing with. So uh, but I think Josh said it well, like low danger does not mean that there's no chance of an avalanche. I think if there's snow on the ground, there's always a chance there. So um, it's good to always kind of have your feelers up and be paying attention to what you're seeing and looking for those signs of, you know, increasing or sorry, decreasing stability. So, yeah. Josh, I, I think you did a, a great job summarizing of all, all the different avalanche fatalities across the, the U.S. this year, including the Northeast, which is kind of a standout. Um, and those, those fatalities and those accidents covered kind of the full spectrum of uh, activity types from snowmobiles to climbers and backcountry skiers of various types. Um, there's a, a question in here about the uh, releasability of AT versus tele bindings. And I think this is kind of going towards um, the discussion about how bindings release and sort of the shortcomings of locked AT bindings, particularly when going uphill, which uh, occurred a couple times this season, resulting in several fatalities. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's a concern for sure, and and it used to be thought of as uh, tele gear was you know locked on your foot more so than AT gear that has typically releasable some DIN settings often, um, but on the uphill mode they're both they're both locked onto your foot. So and and actually more and more the the tele gear has the new new tele gears are becoming more and more releasable as well on the downhill. But on the uphill, they're all the same. Like all the new tech bindings with the tele gear too, they have the, the same tech binding as Dinafit um, AT gear as well. So it's becoming less and less different. Um, and there's, you know, there's definitely lots of avalanches that have, have occurred with tele gear that don't have a, a releasable um, boot, uh, binding, but they get yanked off their feet anyway. And the same thing happens with AT gear that is locked up in walk mode. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's just, I, I don't know of any system that is out there right now that has a walk mode that is releasable, unfortunately. Uh, maybe that's something to come, but it isn't here yet. Uh, Steve, do you anything more about that? Um, I mean, I know that there, there are some folks who will unlock the toe piece for sections of the trail, um, but I think some bindings do better with that than others. And... You know, I've, I've tried it to see if it would work and it was more frustrating than it felt like it was worth. So, um, you know, I think it just kind of, again, it just sort of reiterates the importance of, of really focusing on a safe uphill travel route. Um, and oftentimes that also involves thinking about terrain that is above you that you might not necessarily feel connected to, um, but really being cognizant of, of where you are in the terrain. Um, you know, Josh kind of talked about objective versus subjective hazard. And I think the, 
the one thing in the avalanche triangle between the unstable snow, the triggers, and the terrain choice. You know, the terrain choice is really the one that we can control um, when we choose to be out there. Um, so, you know, when in doubt, keep it simple. Gosh, there were, there were some pretty good rides that, that folks took this year um, in those slides. And we have a question about uh, body positioning while in an avalanche. Any recommendations on what to do if you're, if you're caught in a slide or if you trigger a slide? Sure, keep your, your feet downhill and your head above and paddle nicely uphill. <laughs> it's, if, if we could do that, that would be great. I think that every, all the advice that people give uh, is just fight like hell. Basically, don't give up and just keep struggling and do your best to keep your head uphill and your feet downhill and fight, fight, fight. Uh, and finally, when it's, if it's slowing down and you can muster the uh, wherewithal to club your face up and give yourself an air pocket when it all settles down, if you're buried, um, that's, that's advisable. But boy, when you're in it, it's, uh, there's not much, not much thinking you're doing. Um, it's just, you, you know, just, just fight for your life because that's what you're doing. And to try to get to the side, if you have an idea of which, if there's a side to it or not, try to, you know, do your best to move to that side. Um, but just basically fight. Yeah, to, to Steve's point about terrain choice, I, I think that's awesome advice. And I know I appreciate you guys giving all the best information to keep us on top of the snow for the rest of the season. And there's one last question that might be a, a kind of a fitting closure here. Um, and maybe along those lines is where in the forecast area is the best snow for skiing right now? And don't give away your secrets, but any advice for traveling in the conditions that we have right now and for the expected incoming snow next week? Well, hopefully, uh, hopefully you're all doing your snow dances and then we get that snow next week. I'm not holding my breath for anything more than a few days out, but boy, it sure would be nice. Um, but currently, uh, we're, we're more in a springtime condition uh, cycle. Um, so I think, you know, if you're, if you're looking for better snow conditions, um, timing it right so that you're on southerly, on sunny slopes, you know, southeast to, to southwest, you know, southwest is a lot of stuff is blown away. Uh, but more the southerly faces, if you can time them right to get up them and, and ski down them when they're, when they're softened. Uh, today might have been a tricky one with the clouds and cool weather. So every day is different. Like, you know, we've been having some great, cool nights which have been freezing things up well but um uh the daytimes are variable if, the, if it's windy the slopes aren't going to soften as much and you might be just skiing down firm frozen snow um so paying attention to the winds and the, and the daytime temperatures and the cloud cover uh it's all subtle variations that'll affect that quality of skiing um and then the northerly facing slopes stuff that's shady even though um even though it feels kind of warm during the day, that stuff is, is staying cold and, and just becoming more faceted. So if you can find some you know, nice protected tree slopes that are north facing without tracks in them, that's the crux at this point because everywhere that's really accessible has lots of tracks. But uh, there can be some, some soft snow found. Steve, do you have any other advice for at this point in time? <laughs> no, I think that uh, that kind of covers it. Yeah, the on on the days when, when we're gonna see the good warming, I mean, I think in a lot of ways we've we've been pretty fortunate to have such cold temps at night, even with the warming we're seeing, because because um, yeah, we're still seeing that faceting happening on the surface and on more northerly slopes, and it's kind of that recycled powder, and and on the southerlies where we've got a pretty decent melt free cycle going on and some good corn skin. So all in all, I think. Um, it could be a lot worse, that's for sure. But um, it kind of just, like Josh said, pay attention to the weather. And if it's going to be a sunny day with low winds, I'd hunt for the solars. Awesome. Um, well, looking forward to some good skiing in the future. And I uh, hope everybody has a safe rest of the season. Josh, that's all the, all the questions we have, if you have any other thoughts. 
Um, thanks for your time. Thanks. Thanks again for everyone for joining. I really appreciate uh, the interest and um, do your snow dances and, and stay safe out there. Uh, use our advisory and um, thanks again. Thanks, Mike, for, for hosting and thanks, Steve, for the support as well. Um, looking forward to more of a winter still. Thanks, everybody. Oh, one last, one last thing uh, about that avalanche on Punta Bardini uh, that happened. Uh, there will be a debrief uh, presentation in the next week or two that you can find information to access um, on our website fairly soon. Um, so if you're interested to hear more of the details of what went on with that incident, uh, please stay tuned. And um, there should be a, an interesting and thoughtful discussion about that and also an avalanche incident uh, that occurred last year. Um, and then again, uh, the next month, next uh, Wednesday, um, first Wednesday in, in April, we'll have another education event for you as well. All right. Thanks and have a great night, everybody.